the discussion is going to be about the United Nations Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework. And uh, Samson can... Thank you very much, um, Mordecai Morisa, for that uh, enjoyable conversation. I do have opinions on uh, serving and the withdrawal of those servings, but that's uh, for a very different uh, conversation. I will let you go into reporting. As he has said, my name is Samson Kasumba, and we are in Liffey, Kololo. When you come to Kololo, you understand why it is important to make money and make it in significant amounts. Uh, but it is also a very, very good place to be having conversations like the one we are going to be having. I can tell you, this is not a conversation to be had somewhere in Kawempe. I'm not uh, saying anything about Kawempe, but it's sort of a conversation for this place. It is going to be the launch of the United Nations Sustainable Development Corporation Framework, a mouthful there, for Uganda between the years of 2021 and 2025. And this will be hybrid, and at some point, you will see the President of the Republic in the business of launching this one. The big ones are here. Uh, there are so many people here, huge, uh, with titles and all. I think I'm the smallest here, and right above me is Mildred Tohise. So there isn't anyone small here, and you will see her in a moment. Now, in uh, Resolution 72-279, that was on October 31, back in 2018, that's two years ago, the United Nations General Assembly created a dedicated, impartial, independent, empowered, and sustainable uh, development-focused coordination function for the United Nations Development uh, Systems, the United Nations Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework. I have spoken about that already is the most important instrument. We're talking vehicles here for planning implementation of development activities at country level. Now, the framework is in line with uh, uh, the member states that subscribe to the United Nations a call for the UN development reform to boost coordination in supporting countries to achieve the 2030 agenda. In a panel, I'm going to be uh, uh, coordinating shortly, you will hear us talk about coordination and its role and importance and um, importance and what can be leveraged out of there. But before we get there, let me just give you a little bit more context here. Uh, the framework, the one I just spoke about, articulates the United Nations collective response uh, to support the government of Uganda. You citizens will be involved in addressing national priorities and gaps in their pathways towards meeting the National Development Plan 3 and Sustainable Development Goal targets there. With SDGs at its core, the cooperation framework is closely aligned uh, to NDP 3 and Uganda's National Vision 2040. It will be implemented by all 31 UN entities through uh, three strategic priorities and uh, these I will mention here, transformative and inclusive governance, shared prosperity and in a healthy environment, and human well-being and resilience. The framework is a vehicle for supporting development and social transformation. It also does offer us options uh, to reframe economic policies and practices around uh, sustainability and inclusive diversified job-intensive economic development and promoting access to utilization of basic social protection services and advancing uh, human rights and well-being of the people of this great Republic of Uganda. And my last sentence, an important one is, we are also talking of protecting the environment and the framework also promotes the spirit of partnership that is at the core of the 2030 agenda with strengthened focus on inclusion, advancing gender equality and women empowerment, as well as tackling inequalities. Now, uh, to join me and uh, to kick this off and set the stage, um, I will introduce my panel here that does include, but not limited to, uh, the lady next to me here is uh, known in the civil society world very well, and there she doesn't need introduction uh, but for some of you, she might be in your face for the first time. She is Rita Achiro, and she is the ED 
of uh, your net. And uh, Rita, certainly a pleasure having you uh, on the conversation. Thank you, Samson, and good morning, uh, listeners and viewers. Okay, then uh, from the office of the Prime Minister is Mr. Hoses. Uh, I, I think must be uh, very much Portuguese or Spanish in there. I don't like to say Jose because it sounds strange there. Uh, but he's Jose uh, Tejeza. He's the Commissioner of Strategic Coordination and Implementation. From the very nature of his title, he belongs uh, to this conversation. Um, is it Jose or Jose? Jose. Jose. Okay. Mr. Jose Tejeza, thank you so much and welcome to the conversation. We also have a man that is. Not so innocent in appearance, but his name is Innocent Fred uh, Ejoru. He is the UNDP team leader and is here. Innocent man, get very innocent this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Samson. Uh, very good morning to you, listeners and viewers. Uh, thank you. And lastly, but by no means least, is uh, um, a young person, uh, and she is the youth representative on the conversation. She is Miss Destiny uh, Gladys uh, Chaiga. She is from the United Nations Association of Uganda. Your destiny this morning is to say good morning. Thank you, Samson. Good morning, dear viewers and listeners. Okay, fantastic. And uh, you understand the times in which we are. We speak through barriers. I am very sure you can hear me from uh, wherever you are. I'll begin with you, Innocent, so that you can innocently answer the question, if you may, what are the key coordination lessons under the previous frameworks, implementation, uh, and uh, in terms of achieving SDGs. Uh, you do have quite a, an experience in handling this. Uh, no team leader would come in experience, would they? Great. Thank you very much uh, for your kind words as well. Now, um, frameworks, talking about implementation frameworks uh, and how these have uh, played out in terms of uh, delivery or achieving the SDGs. Now, uh, we must applaud the government of Uganda for the leadership that has been shown in pushing the agenda to deliver the sustainable development goals. Uh, in the context of the current National Development Plan 2 that we are implementing, which comes to an end about now as we go into the third phase, we've seen ownership at the national level. There's definitely been ownership and this has been seen in terms of what went into the design of the NDP too. We had an alignment of up to 69% in terms of how the National Development Plan was taking forward the SDGs agenda. We also saw, uh, in terms of uh, frameworks, an institutional mechanism to support the way coordination is done. And this was articulated in a SDG uh, roadmap to guide the delivery of these SDGs, and, and there's been those frameworks at the national level, including reporting and, uh, you know, results frameworks. All these have come and have helped the cause. But I think the lessons we've learned is that, uh, of course, S NDP2 missed an important target of achieving the middle income status, and would be very interested in why was this the case. So there are areas where we certainly need to improve in terms of how we set frameworks to drive the delivery of the national transformation agenda, but more importantly, achieving the sustainable development goals as well. Now, the lessons we've learned are very important. Frameworks alone are not enough. Mm. Frameworks at the national level, having a vision, having a national development plan, having a results and reporting framework, etc. guidelines may not be enough. We need to go beyond that and see more coherence in terms of how we establish these frameworks at the different levels. I'll give you an example. We got the NDP2, fine, but the process to translate that at the sector level, you know, in the ministries, in the districts, was not as fast as the establishment of the NDP2 itself. So we had a challenge. By the midpoint of NDP2, we had only up to 50% of the sectors showing responsiveness in terms of driving the SDG agenda. So one important lesson there is timing is absolutely crucial. The other issue is we did the, uh, we saw this, uh, the national roadmap for SDGs also coming a little late. Maybe we needed that guidance a bit earlier. 
So timing is very, very important. And going into NDP3, we need to already start positioning sectors, start positioning districts to be part and parcel or in fact drivers of this transformation process in terms of the delivery would like to do. So timing and coherence, very, very important. The other issue is prioritization. We are talking about 17 goals with over 150 targets and indicators. So where do you pitch the investments in terms of where you can see quicker results and where you can see acceleration? Now, uh, I think we must applaud government for sitting and deciding as cabinet that there is a need for us to accelerate these SDGs now that we are left with about nine or so, uh, five or so years in this decade of action, what do we exactly do? So acceleration is very important, but you need to prioritize. So we've learned that we can do more to prioritize, but this has to be driven with evidence. Evidence is going to be very instrumental uh, in helping us understand how to prioritize. Uh, COVID has created lots of disruptions, and all of a sudden we are asking questions about resilience. At the community level, even at the national level, the informal sector has been battered. Many productive sectors have been battered. So how have we been building resilience into the way we've been planning? Where has resilience been in the framework of the plans we've been driving to give us that capacity to be able to respond and maybe not suffer as much shocks as we've seen? Business competitiveness, how have we been driving this? Issues around governance and accountability, especially at the subnational level and how we drive local economic development. So prioritization is another important lesson we learn. And uh, financing is another interesting issue that I think is an area where we need to do a lot. If you look at the uh, certifications that the National Planning Authority issues on compliance, our budgets and plans annually are, are not fully speaking to the big results we would, want, we would want to achieve. And that is a very big challenge because it simply means that your resources up to 40% of them might be missing the most important, uh, you know, the most important issue. So we've got a very big challenge around, around, around financing, which is really a question of alignment and how the budgets have been responding to the indications from the plans as much as they try to push the SDG agenda. I was talking about timing. We also have a challenge. The reporting and results frameworks have been coming a little late. You know, how do we know that we are making progress? We need to know from the word go that these are the results we are interested in. This is how we will measure progress at all levels and deploy the, the capacities to generate the data to do precisely that. If you look at the voluntary national report uh, that, uh, you know, thankfully the president signed on it, it's a very good report, but we don't have data on important goals. If you look at inequalities, inequality is a big problem here. You know, we want to raise as many people as possible out of the situations they are in from a poverty perspective. But if we cannot measure the changes that are happening based on the risks they face or the interventions we are making, then we have a very big challenge, and specifically around the data, administrative data. If you consider crime, for instance, and issues around gender-based violence, we get reports from the police regularly, but maybe we need to find better ways to do that, automate these systems, standardize them, get the same recording of information in this police station, the other police station, that hospital, so that we can build a case to maybe find justice for that young girl or that mm. mom who has been battered. Now, we have challenges with administrative data, and sometimes we have to wait for three years to, to do surveys to be able to determine how far we've gone. So that does not help our capacity to drive in a very targeted way towards achieving the results we would want. Now, policy coherence, if I may lastly talk about policy coherence. Policies here are generally good, and um, they, they speak to the goals. But the key issue now is how institutions interact mm. at different levels. That's where we have seen a lot of challenges. You've seen uh, mandates that sometimes clash and that undermines the capacity of, of, of the government to work coherently. That's a very big challenge. Also, how the center interacts with the subnational level is also very, very crucial. 
because we must situate the SDG agenda at the local level, because that's where the people are, that's where the front line of the government machinery is, that's where the resources are. So how do we use local economic transformation development to drive you know, an integrated way to achieving results on the SDGs? So we need to tackle those type of issues uh, in a more meaningful, in a meaningful way. So the lessons we've learned that yes, we do planning, we have frameworks, but these frameworks need to land on the ground and also be seen in giving direction at the parish, sub-county, district level. That's going to be very important, and also for the sectors. Now, the outlook of NDP3 is very good. Uh, it's, it's very pro-growth. It's very pro-poor. It's a very good strategic framework. Can be, uh, can be delivered through a local economic development you know, agenda. You know, how do we leverage that to drive more speed into our, our results on the, on the SDGs? So lots of opportunities there. Lastly, private sector. The private sector is a big player that we need to bring more into this space. Leverage knowledge from the private sector. They are always thinking about a profit. So innovation happens there faster. We need to tap into that innovation. The digital economy is here and the private sector is very instrumental in that regard. How do we tap into the digital economies and sort of build uh, the ecosystems that support us around issues to do with financing, uh, etc. So these are some of the lessons we've learned and uh, they have already shaped the directions in terms of the plans to implement the NDP3. But what's going to be important is for us to hit the road running, move from the national frameworks down to the sector and district frameworks, work for more coherence, bring more evidence to drive the process we are looking at, leverage the role of the private sector, and uh, tackle issues of institutional you know, coordination, and we'll be good to go. Well, <clears throat> if uh, you hear somebody say finally, and they speak and say finally again, then you know they grew around very good preaching. Um, uh, preachers who say in conclusion and they do, uh, they do another 10 minutes. So you must have grown in a very uh, clergy laden family. But you spoke about inequalities. Even with the Equal Opportunities Commission, they still exist? Innocent? Yes, uh, we, we, we still have inequalities, as you know. Uh, the country has done well to tackle poverty, but we've seen the numbers changing. Poverty is back in the East, and a big percentage of the population there has dropped. Uh, so these inequalities, we need to deal with them. I mean, if you look at the impact of... So poverty, you want po poverty to be distributed equally? No, 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 no. We want to lift people out of poverty. <laughs> okay. We want to lift people out of poverty. The poverty is too bad. Just take your car home in the evening. And, and experience it, you know, with the vendors trying to make ends meet. That is, I think, the best image we could use just to okay. see and understand the differences. And this is happening in Kololo. It's happening just next to affluence. How do you explain that? You know, we need to reduce that scenario as much as possible. Uh, thank you very much, Innocent. Uh, let's just bring in uh, uh, Mr. Joses Tejeza, who is from the office of uh, the Prime Minister. He is, thankfully, for uh, purposes of this conversation, the Commissioner, Strategic Coordination and Implementation. Um, we will begin by asking you, Mr. Tejeza, uh, to make a response, and then in your conclusion... Uh, towards the end, you talk about recommendations um, uh, going forward um, uh, out of the lessons that uh, he has mentioned. Let's hear you come on the mic. Yeah, thank you very much, Samson. Just tap the button at the end there. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much, Samson, and li uh, listeners. And Innocent, thank you very much for that dissection of the, of what I can say, the lessons that we have learned but probably I would also add some few other lessons in probably another perspective. Uh, the partnerships are paramount, and we have seen them coming out in a strong way. And actually, us being here in this fashion is commitment of that, uh, of that way we have moved as government. And they were, we have also got deeper localization. The decentralization policy of government is strong and has achieved many results. And as SDGs or as uh, government pushing forward 
SDGs, we cherish that policy, and actually in Ngora, a pilot has been made. So the localization and pushing down the SDG agenda for everyone from all levels to understand it has been something that we put our minds to and we're also putting our effort to. We have also had uh, a lesson in leadership. As we developed the United Nations uh, Cooperation Framework, we as government co-chaired the process with the UN. And one thing that is coming up, uh, all that came up as a lesson, and what we are seeing is that we need leadership. We need people to take charge. And actually, Samson and members, I can come to the National Development Plan 3, which we have just finalized, and which I'm happy to say is well aligned to this cooperation framework, now is moving away from the sectoral approach. As you all know, we are now into the programmatic approach. We have 18 programs, but one of the things that everybody has said and has agreed to is that the leadership, both political and technical, of those programmatic areas will be the, the biggest ingredient that will make us achieve our goals. Because all we are doing is for results. And uh, Innocent has put that very well. All we are doing is for results. And if we have working in silos, the, sector, the sectors, by the way, are, we are going to do away with the sector-wide approach to planning. We are now going the program approach to planning. And what this means is that everyone must look towards the result. But the first question would be, do we understand the results we are looking for? Because at any level there can be results, and that's why we are talking of leadership. There must be a leadership that moves from itself to a higher level. Because when you are in the Ministry of Works, you can say, my result is making a road. When you, are in, uh, when you are in the Ministry of Energy, you can say, my result is producing electricity. And everybody will say, that's a good result. But what we are saying now is that everybody must understand the overall result that we want as a country. And that calls for leadership. So that when somebody at local government level is doing his work, he understands and says, well, this has come out, and let me call it an output. Our result is up there, commonly purposed. And if that is not achieved, that means that the citizens, the civil society, and all who will be now looking at us as government will look at us as non-performers. And that's why I want to say that that leadership should be inculcated right from that level so that somebody is able to take charge, to take responsibility. We've been to uh, a system where there are excuses. Before you start, even after the plan, there are excuses. They are saying, you see, this plan cannot be achieved because the money will not be enough, because we are cutting money, finance is cutting money. What government is saying now is that make commitments to the results that you will achieve so that there is a responsibility up there. And that is what I wanted to say about the leadership. But, um, Samson, as you have asked, uh, the contextualization of uh, government coordination, which I had, and the Office of the Prime Minister, is that we want all players towards did, those did, results. Did you say which you had or had? Which I had. Okay. H-E-A-D. -E okay. okay. <laughs> which I had, the mass probably is, 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 killing the, is killing the D. Yeah, I just, just wanted to be sure that the viewers understand you had it, not had it. I had, yes, I had strategic coordination and implementation of programs and policy across government. Yes, so now what we, what we want is that all activities, all programs, all projects are integrated. And this integration means that whatever you are doing, wherever you are, must have an effect on the overall result. If you do something and you are not felt, then you should ask yourself uh, a question whether you are in line with the government aspirations. Or if you do nothing and you are not felt the same way, even when you do nothing, you should be felt. Because uh, something else that we think as government will have to be done is to restructure the human resources so that everyone who comes to office, everybody who works, goes to contribute to uh, the aspirations of government. And uh, my sister, probably in civil society, I, I can say this at this time, we appreciate the roles of civil society and we know that they are advocates and they hold the government accountable. So for some reason, I like that word, but I like it halfway. Because, uh, and I'm happy that we are going this way. When you hold government accountable, 
you, the, always remind me of our primary school debates, opposers and proposers, and here is the motion. What we want to happen now is civil society to be proposers at one time and to be opposers at another time. Government to be proposers at some time and then others to be uh, proposers at another time. And I'm saying this because in our programmatic approach and even in the UN, Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework Development, we have sat with uh, civil society, with the private sector, and with all players. And we all know where we are headed to. So these goals, these aspirations are for all of us. So at any one time, I want civil society to come and be a proposer, and at another time, come and be an opposer, just like government will come and be. So this integration is paramount that what you do affects the other sector, and what you do contributes to the whole. We are here to achieve the whole together. And uh, in our framework, we also, like uh, colleagues who are implementing, or partners, to know that we want the issue of balance to be there. If one of the programs is going to run ahead of the other, if you say you are playing very well in a team, if you can equate it to really running, if you run so fast 100 meters and the next person runs slowly, the team does not score, the team does not win. So if we are going to be a winning team, we must balance. Where resources are inadequate, for some programmatic interventions, and they are in excess for your intervention, or they can be trimmed, please raise the flag and say, I'm moving very fast, but my brother is moving slowly and will not achieve the common goal. So that support of each other, that balancing, we really want it. And then lastly, on regard to that, the sequencing and the timing. All of us in the government, in the private sector, must know the time we are going to do our things, must know the time we are going to do or execute our mandates. If I do my work today very well, and tomorrow my work is supposed to fit into another partner's work to achieve the goal, and the other partner has not done his work, that means that even my work of today will not work. But what we've been having in government and even in private sector problems exists is just a silo, a sector to come out and say, well, I did very well, I'm scoring 99%. But if you have built a road, and you have done the things which you are supposed to do, and then probably the, 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 the people, all the cars that are supposed to move on that road to go and deliver supplies have not been purchased, then that road will not fulfill the health outcome of ensuring that we have health for all. So what we do, or if you say, I've finished building, I've done my part very well, I'll build the hospital. But if you have not trained the doctors, then that hospital is not achieving our outcome. So want that integration, and we want that balance, and also we want that timeliness and sequencing done by the different sectors. Uh, what I can probably say uh, as a last uh, point, and very last, uh, though I'm a preacher, is that uh, we are underpinned by a policy which was passed by cabinet uh, in, uh, in 2016, and this policy spells the framework which we have developed for SDGs. And this framework has got layers, and everybody is involved. And one thing that Uganda has done is to appoint a dedicated minister to SDGs. Uganda will have a minister who is fully dedicated to SDGs, and we also have a secretariat which is giving support to government. Fledged secretariat that actualizes, and I think many of you have seen it coming, but this framework, when it goes to the customization of SDGs, we have data, we have got finance, we have planning and we have communication. Those were areas which were pointed out as gaps and we have put technical working groups to ensure that those are made better. And above those, we have a reporting, coordination and m and &E technical working group. And then we have the SDG task force and up to the PCC, which is chaired by the Right Honorable Prime Minister. So we have adequate frameworks that will drive the SDG agenda and we have ensured that the alignment of the three strategic objectives of the United Nations Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework are in complete sync with our five objectives under the NDP3. Thank you, Samso. Uh, thank you very much. I will tell you from what I do know that one of the reasons why the brain is very, very difficult to operate on is because of how complicated it is. It's more complicated to operate on the brain. Uh, than to trim your fingernails. So when something is very intricate and complicated, then moving it and uh, fixing it uh, can be a problem. But uh, Mr. Tejiza, you said that uh, one of the things that is going to happen now is that uh, 
if what one is doing is not failed, then they need to ask themselves a very serious question. And uh, you come from a culture of permanent and passionable. Uh, some of us are, th are thinking, are they just going to be asking themselves questions or are they going to be sent home? Uh, Samson, this is the debate. Mm. Actually, the debate goes even up to the contract staff, permanent secretaries and all people who are on, uh, who are on uh, agreements, performance agreements. The debate or the question is, if somebody has not performed in year one of review, mm. because we have even appointed ministers, ministers are going to be the technical heads for each of the 18 programs. If, for example, a permanent secretary has not performed in year one, are you going to keep the contract for year two and three to be spoiled? So the thinking we have in government is absolutely similar to yours. Okay. But at the same time, mm. you must realize that we are getting into these reforms this year, financial year 2020, 2021, and the sustainable cooperation framework is moving alongside the uh, starting in December after the assistance framework. But the point is that we are now also thinking towards that one on two layers. One, when we arrange our programs, activities, and down to inputs, are all the staff relevant? Do we have to re rearrange them? Do we have to let them go home? That's whatever one. Two, those who are in, like you are calling permanent and pensionable. Mm -hmm. By the way, that is now losing, that is now losing steam. You know, His Excellency talking, and even civil servants, public servants are also understanding that what we need to do is results. So the second point about permanent and pensionable, we also think that there are going to be reforms in the policy, reforms in the, even legislation. Because what we are doing now, for example, I told you about the policy of 2016, the national coordination policy. Mm. It will call for a review because of what is happening. Even some legal framework, like the Public Finance Management Act, and so many others. Okay. So in a summary, something what I can tell you is that our thinking is similar to yours. And the thing, and, and the, the, where we are moving is that this first year of implementation, we are calling it a year of changing things to make sure that we, we, we get into the gear. So we are improving as we move. We gain the 60 percent, but we have the 40 percent. We can't wait. We okay. can't keep on zero. Okay. Mm. Well, you know, you are speaking to a government technocrat when you ask a straight question, and after a long answer, you don't know whether it was a yes, a no, or somewhere in between. Uh, but uh, I can tell you it's not very easy matters, uh, because if the goal is to end poverty, and somebody's work has not ended poverty, sending them home also begins poverty in their family. Uh, um, they say in Russian, have you been to Sivyangu? But let's uh, just bring in... Uh, um, uh, uh, Destiny Gladys uh, Chaiga here uh, into the conversation before I bring in uh, Rita. Um, the role of uh, young people and the media and other stakeholders in uh, sort of uh, making sure that there is accountability uh, for results. He said uh, that he doesn't want only opposers. Mm -hmm. He wants also proposers. So let's hear you propose, uh, then if there is time, oppose. Okay, thank you, Samson. Uh, I, I, I believe that we shall have the time to propose and oppose even beyond the moment of today, right now. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the UN in Uganda team and the government of Uganda for ensuring that the young people were part of the formulation of the United Nations Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework. Um, part of the team that I work with that is under the Youth SDGs Coalition that is monitoring the, the implementation of the SDGs, but mainly among the young people across the country, where among those who sat in the various meetings during this lockdown to see that the formulation is inclusive of what the young people have, and that will enable them to ably participate in its implementation across all the different sectors in the country and also at the global level. Now, uh, we all know that the young people in Uganda are the majority of the population, with uh, over 77 percent of it being the youth. And with that also comes the fact that Almost 33.3% uh, of the young people make the unemployment rate in Uganda. So with all that is happening right now, the COVID-19 pandemic, most of them who are supposed to be in school are now at home. 
some were laid off because of the challenges that the pandemic brought about. These are some of the things that have uh, challenged the young people as of now in relation to achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, we are glad that uh, the development framework is here to help accelerate the progress of the achievement of the NDP3 and also Uganda's vision 2040. Looking at the fact that we have been in these various aspects of life as the young people, we know that we have a great contribution to the country's development, economically, politically, socially, and in all the other sectors that we are part of. However, we are requesting that I believe it is high time for the young people to be looked at, uh, for the young people to, to be looked at as uh, an asset other than a liability. When we talk of the young people of Uganda, often people want to associate uh, them with violence, with uh, unemployment, with low level of skills to render, with uh, joblessness, the rowdiness. But if we are to ask ourselves, what are the real root causes that are making the young people be in these labeled negative aspects of community? These are things that um, are beyond just what they are doing, but rather the cause of why they are doing it. If we can address those causes, the underlying causes, and not just consider the surface outcomes. I believe our contribution towards the national development of our country will be greater. Um, Innocent, as was uh, talking, mentioned something about timing, the crucial aspect of timing. And I'm confident that this is the right time to look at the contribution the young people are making, regardless of how little or how big. Because through the engagements we have had in the different regions and the UNDP and uh, the SDGs coalition, youth coalition, we have been able to see the vast work that the young people are doing. And I believe NBS has, has been showcasing some of these uh, innovative ideas they have. And those are just a handful of what they are doing. So if we can look at what they are doing more than the surface outcomes of the things that are oppressing them, I believe we shall be able to enhance their skills, but also leverage on what they can offer at national development, uh, local level standards, in our different organization, organizations in the private sector, so that we can move forward in conclusively and in uh, an inclusive way. Um, this, uh, this framework, the, the three pillars on which the priorities it stands for, I am confident in all these three that they contain the aspect of youth. Look at transformative and inclusive governance. We are looking at a time where the young people will be looked at as um, brilliant enough to lead different sectors. And how will this be possible? It can only be possible by encouraging a system of cross-generational leadership. Like a parent, if you want a successful legacy for your family or your business enterprise, whatever you have set, you'll make an effort to see that your children are included in these small decisions you make concerning your family that you can have a successful legacy to live when you are not there. And for us to have this transformative and inclusive governance, you cannot leave the young people behind. So we need that cross-generational kind of leadership where you will hold the hands of the young person that you're saying, okay, I don't think you can do this, but can I guide you to do the way I wish this country to run or for this a particular thing to run even when I am not there? Because when all is gone, the population of the young people will continue. So uh, that uh, cross-generational leadership is important, and we are calling for that. Shared prosperity in a healthy environment. During this lockdown, uh, some of the team members that we have engaged with and organizations have been going out to share about reproductive health. Because during the lockdown, many 
uh, young girls have gotten pregnant, and uh, there are different reasons. Some may be the parents um, allowed the young girls to go because they need money. Some have been defiled and raped by strangers, but also by people who are close to them. To tackle the aspects of living in a healthy environment beyond just reproductive, uh, uh, reproductive health, but uh, safety in all aspects, we need to integrate the young people. What they are doing is there, but we need to empower them more. Not just looking at the financial empowerment that has been tagged to us, really, but we can do more than just the financial empowerment. A skill that you have endorsed on us, a skill that you have invested in us, can go way, way beyond just the money that you're going to give for one activity. So that is what we are looking for, and we are hoping to have that. Resilience. Um, to our leaders and to the young people especially out there, I believe in us. I believe we have been resilient. We have uh, faced different circumstances, and we have prevailed. First of all, we have managed to stay alive, to see that the development agendas of our countries are coming to pass. So I'm asking that let us be even more resilient in seeing that our impact, our positive impact, is felt in society, in our communities, and in the development of our country, and in the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, even amidst all the likely challenges of unemployment, of uh, joblessness, of uh, sickness, and all those that you feel that you are in. Thank you. Uh, Destiny, thank you very much. And uh, for those of you watching, uh, you are watching uh, a panel conversation or discussion uh, of at the launch of the UN Development uh, uh, UN Sustainable Development Corporation Framework. Uh, that's 2021 to 2025, uh, and we are talking about uh, our cooperation and uh, Destiny there. Um, noted that uh, her generation should be congratulated uh, for staying alive. I can tell you uh, there are so many temptations these days. Uh, staying alive in and of itself can become a huge, huge decision. I've seen so many young people make reckless decisions, and they just lost their lives, um, uh, cut them short themselves. And the thing about God is uh, he allows you. If you don't want to leave, you take a decision. He'll let you be. It's a discipline of God there. Uh, the preacher man here will agree with me. I've never understood why God does that. He knows life is a good thing. You decide to take it. He says, fine, you take it. Um, but we'll bring in uh, Rita here, uh, who is not going to preach. Uh, she is uh, from uh, the civil society, passionately so. And uh, she is going to weigh in on uh, how... Civil society organizations, youth, the media as well, ourselves, um, and other stakeholders can play a role in demanding and requesting and negotiating and appealing for accountability. Thank you very much, Samson, and thanks to my colleagues. Um, before I go to how civil society can demand for accountability. I want to agree with my colleagues on some of the key lessons that we learned along the way on, in the past uh, framework. First of all, I think it's important for us to appreciate that a framework provides an overarching plan, but also for us to appreciate the fact that it is not the only factor for success. And I want to agree with uh, my colleagues and particularly um, the, the colleague from the Prime Minister's office that there are a number of factors that we need to consider for us to succeed. Among these include the issue of leadership. Leadership is very crucial for the success of any framework or uh, program. The other is the availability of resources. And it is also important, it's one thing for us to have the resources, it's another thing for these resources to be used in the right uh, way. 
And one of the things we also know in the implementation is the hemorrhage of resources that has let us down in achieving or attaining some of our goals. Uh, as we launch the new framework today, those are some of the things we should need, um, where we need to nip the bud and ensure that we do not lose a lot of the resources. The other issue is the issue of capacity. Institutions, there is capacity at individual level, capacity at institutional level, and capacity in the collective. These institutions have individuals. So we need to ask ourselves, do these individuals, and I, I really appreciate uh, my colleague from OPM that said there's need for training. Do we all appreciate the goal that we are aiming to, to achieve? As an institution, do we have the mechanisms, the facilities in place to achieve that? And as a collective, as MDAs or even other development partners, do they have this capacity? And these are some of the things we need to put in place as we look uh, going forward. The other issue that uh, is very crucial is the issue of, um, or the lesson that we learned along the way. And I, I, I think it was mentioned earlier on as well. It is the ability to get everybody on board at the planning process, for us to be able to appreciate. Um, for example, as the women's movement, we were very active in developing the NDP3. We actually did a... a position paper to give to NPA. So such processes are crucial for participation, but also informs monitoring and evaluation. And that takes me to your question of how we can participate in calling for accountability. You can only call for accountability if you understand what it is all about. Otherwise, you will not be able to do that. So through the participatory processes, there was an ownership, uh, or there is ownership, which is very crucial. It, it, it brings about participation. It can also bring about uh, accountability or it enhances accountability. However, in the, in the implementation, some of the key lessons learned are you find most, there's a lot of focus of implementation in particular areas. And I think that's why uh, somebody said um, in the Eastern region, there is so much poverty happening. So maybe we need to start thinking, how do we spread this implementation to cover all the other uh, regions or districts so that we don't see other regions um, doing better than the others, or we try to minimize. Of course, there might be differences, but let's try and minimize so that the, 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 the gap is not so wide. The other is also to minimize the weaknesses in the areas of priority. One of the things that affects us, particularly those of us in the women's movement, is for example, issue of maternal mortality. Why up to today in 2020, maternal mortality is at the rate that it is, despite the fact that it has come down slightly. And I think again, the colleague from OPM said, you'll find that um, you provide, uh, maybe you build a health center, but are the midwives there? Are the delivery beds there? Are the emergency kits there? So these are things we need to ensure that we, we, we nip in the bud and, and, and ensure that those weak, weakness areas are um, addressed. The other issue is the issue of comparative advantage. I think that is a lesson learned that during implementation, not everybody focuses on everything. They, there was an opportunity to cluster and ensure that those who have a comparative advantage on a particular area focus on that. And that has yielded quite a, a number of results. And again, as it was said, for us particularly in civil society, now we are, we are embracing that so that we do not you know, uh, run everywhere, but you have a specific uh, focus of uh, interest. Another issue is that... Yes. Maybe just before you, um, you continue, there's something I noted, and uh, I think it's of interest. Um, you speak about maternal mortality. So in accountability, are we saying that and asking that it's not enough that you have built a road to a health center and that you have put the building there? But the question is, have maternal mortality figures gone down? So if you have done all that and the figures have not gone down, then are we saying you have no basis, at least in the conversation we're having, to be just thumping? 
you see, if your, if your plan of taking that road was to reduce maternal mortality and it has not reduced, then there's, you, you should say you haven't scored. You might have um, benefited other uh, factors in life, but not the issue of maternal mortality. But for you to be able to do that effectively, you need to understand comprehensively, and I think I agree with the issue of data, understand comprehensively why the high numbers of maternal mortality. It might not necessarily be the road. It might be uh, social and gender issues that are happening at home. The, the doctors or the professionals tell us that one, the reasons why we have high maternal mortality, I think there are three, there are three delays. There's the delay at home, delay on the way to the health center, and delay at the health center. So you need to understand all those three delays. The delay number two, which is delay on the road, is partly what you want to address by creating the, the, the I mean building the road. If you do that, it's okay. But if you haven't addressed the delays at home, the gender dynamics, who decides who goes when to hospital and how they go to hospital, then the delays at the health center, when I get there or when this mother gets there, is there a nurse, is there a doctor, is there blood, is there, you know, all that. So it, it, there, is, there has to be a multi-pronged approach in addressing these challenges. And I gave maternal mortality just as an example. So th th that is um, an issue. Now going... Uh, maybe as I conclude, you asked me a question, how can civil society contribute in calling for accountability? And I'm happy that um, my colleague from OPM is appreciating the role of civil society, which is something we need to uh, speak about more. Maybe your colleagues could also uh, talk about it more. Many times people think uh, civil society don't have a contribution. But also, people think civil society are only NGOs. Civil society is beyond the NGOs that you know. The media is part of civil society, if you didn't know that. It, religious institutions are part of civil society. Professional bodies are part of civil society. Workers' unions are part of civil society. So in, in all this, there is a contribution that all these institutions or uh, bodies bring on board. Now, what role can they play? There are a number of uh, roles that civil society can play. For example, the media, as they say, they are the watchdog, they are the ones who provide information. Just by giving out information for the citizenry to know what is due to them, th that enhances their ability of knowledge and their ability to follow, their ability to track, and their ability to question. So civil society plays a role of awareness creation, conscientization, and ensuring that citizens are able to participate. You've seen citizens participating in the development of uh, development frameworks, the NDP. You have seen citizens participating in budget uh, development processes. You have seen citizens participating in the development of policy and legal framework. All that is part of the, the mechanisms that civil society can contribute in terms of calling on accountability. The other is, of course, uh, what my colleague talked about is uh, the issue of data. And one of the skills that we have, I can proudly so say, in civil society is the ability to do uh, data, uh, data collection but analysis to package it. And when you talk about being proposers and, proposition, uh, and opposers, one of the things we've done well as civil society is actually to be proposers and opposers. When government is developing any um, policy, program, or even legislation, we actually do proposals. Now, uh, when we oppose, it is at the point of calling for accountability. Maybe it might not be called opposition, but really calling for accountability. That, you know, this is what you agree, this is what you put on paper, however, this is, this is, you're not on track. And I think that is where the accountability aspect comes, but not opposition per se. So, in terms of um, data and statistics, then the other, which uh, I see Samson looking at me, is the issue <laughs> is is the issue of uh, follow up and tracking if if there is anything civil society has contributed to enormously in this country is the tracking of implementation of programs policy and the legal framework whether it is at the national regional and international level while we are interested in tracking most of our um, national policy and programs, 
Uganda is also signatory to a number of international and uh, regional uh, protocols and, and conventions. And it is civil society that has kept government in particular on track to ensure that we track these processes and report to government. And they use that to plan to, 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 to budget, but also implement. And that is a critical role that civil society has. I cannot conclude without talking about the contribution of women in the implementation, but also the lessons that we've learned. I have told you we are at the forefront in terms of contribution, making proposals to government. However, one of the key lessons we learned, or we have learned, and I hope it, it will be improved, is the fact that we actively participate in the planning, we actively participate in contributing technically and otherwise, and many of these issues are actually put into the documents. Like NDP2, a lot of the issues we took uh, were put into NDP2, even NDP3. When it comes to resourcing, we don't see this type of resources. So one of the issues, and as I've, one of the things I said at the beginning, a framework can be there, but there are other factors that you need to put in place for it to succeed. And we hope the issues that affect women and girls in this country are not just put on paper, but all the other factors that ensure they are successful are also put in place. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rita. Of course, uh, the issues affecting the boys also end up affecting the girls. I think the girls face the issues more because of the boys than because of uh, you know, themselves. Uh, the danger of having very big eyes is when you are attentive, they're listening. You may be misconstrued as uh, mentioning the time has run out. I just um, have uh, the wrong size of eyes, if I may. Uh, but uh, the big if is um, whether all this does work as we expect it to work. Um, and I've seen this in many relationships. Uh, when people begin relationships, uh, nobody promises the other uh, that we will end up in a divorce and uh, I will beat you in the process. Uh, they begin with very lovely promises, and in between there, coordination fails, and then the two partners involved and the others, including the children, uh, fail the coordination process, and before you know it, uh, the relationship has gone south. But I am very hopeful uh, that this one is one that will go very well in terms of uh, marriages. Uh, at least uh, I have had some very interesting uh, ideas are coming from uh, uh, Destiny Gladys uh, Chaiga from the United Nations uh, Association of Uganda and uh, the immediate former presenter was uh, Ms. Rita Achiro, Executive Director of UONET, their civil society. They are a little bit more than other members of the civil society, we in the media, uh, but we are all together as civil society. And uh, we also did hear Mr. Innocent Fred Ejolu uh, from the UNDP. I will not mention more about that. Uh, he was hoping I would say something. No, I won't. Uh, <laughs> I will not. And uh, uh, certainly uh, Mr. Yozes. Uh, Joseph, Joseph uh, Tejeza, uh, Commissioner, Strategic Coordination and Implementation uh, from the Government of the Republic of Uganda in uh, the Office of the Prime Minister. Don't add anything to the Office of the Prime Minister, I insist. Um, we are going into a break. I'm sorry for continuing uh, to call you Jose. I think that's very much to do with I'm learning a lot of Spanish a lot associated uh, to the football club uh, that I support. There's a lot of Spanish intake at the moment. Uh, don't you mention anything about that as well. But let me mention that when we come back from the break, we will be switching panels, and uh, we will be bringing in uh, the vigor, the energy, the passion, and sure, sure skill of Mildred to ISIS. She refuses to become honorable. Uh, because she intends to be in the media. So those of you who want to switch her roles, uh, please, please leave the good lady alone. We go into a break and we'll come back. It will be Mildred twice. But if you've been watching, you've also seen uh, images coming uh, from Entebbe, and that's because at some point uh, the President of the Republic, uh, Yori Kaguta Museveni, Father of the Nation, will be on uh, to launch this one uh, with all the big ones involved. For now, let's get into a break. I do have a bit of coffee here. Uh, that I need to consume and also go in a corner, take off a mask and breathe properly. Part of the renewed 
efforts by the United Nations to support the implementation of the National Development Plan 3 and the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals in Uganda, His Excellency President Yori Museveni and UN Resident Coordinator Her Excellency Rosa Malango on behalf of the UN Secretary General will launch the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework 2021-2025. This Wednesday, 9th of September, 2020 at 10 a.m. Live on NBS and Facebook. Follow the launch by using the hashtag UNUG Corporation Framework. This Wednesday, 9th of September, 2020 at 10 a.m. Live on NBS and Facebook. Follow the launch by using the hashtag UNUG Corporation Framework. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for keeping it uh, NBS television. Of course, as earlier on from the very first panel, which was moderated by Samson Kasumba. Thank you so much, uh, Samson. And uh, of course, like he did say, uh, this is the launch of the United Nations Sustainable Development uh, Corporation Framework. Quite a mouthful, like he did say. And remember, this is going to be implemented by about uh, 31 uh, United Nations entities. But looking at three strategic priorities, which I want to re-echo once again, and uh, those priorities are basically about uh, transformative and inclusive governance, as well as uh, shared prosperity in a healthy environment, and also human well-being and resilience. In our second panel, uh, which starts right about now, and in just a few minutes as well, much later on, we'll be getting to the State House, Plot 1, where the President of the Republic of Uganda will be launching uh, this particular framework. And uh, in this session, I will be discussing the aspect of financing the sustainable uh, development in Uganda with a focus on NDP3 uh, together with uh, this particular develop, uh, development framework, which is the United um, Nations Sustainable Development uh, Corporation Framework, as well as uh, the Bilateral uh, Corporation. My name is Mildred Tuhaise, and thank you so much for joining us right now. And uh, this is going to be quite an elaborate panel, and in no particular order, allow me to introduce to you some of my panelists. I'll start off with uh, Mr. Simon Peter Nsereko, who is uh, responsible <clears throat> actually for providing uh, substantive advice on innovative economic and sustainable development policies. You can say hello to us. Thank you, Mildred. Uh, uh, good morning, viewers. I'll be contributing to this panel, providing information on uh, financing for development in the context of NDP3 and the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you very much, Simon. Also, I do have uh, Brian Tahinduka on the panel. And Brian is a sector head, power and infrastructure, telecoms, in personal and business banking Division at Stanbeck Bank Uganda. Welcome. Thank you so much, Mildred. A uh, very good morning, our viewers and our listeners. Thank you. All right. I will also have Mr. Businje, who is an executive director of Smart Youth Network Initiative, a youth-led network organization that aims at particularly supporting community transformation through skills development, smart climate actions, as well as digitization. Remember, in this COVID era, it has taught us quite a lot that we ought to have gone digital yesterday. Welcome, Mr. Osinje. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Midred. My name is Businja Rudin, the Executive Director, Smart Youth Network Initiative. Um, um, I want to uh, uh, welcome uh, uh, and invite the whole, uh, the citizens of Uganda, to um, highly participate in the launch of, the, of this framework. Uh, it's going to run for the five years, so expect a lot. And uh, thank you so much. All right. I do also have Dr. Olo, who is the acting manager, microeconomic planning at the National Planning Authority. He has quite a humongous uh, CV, but I won't say everything. But Dr. Patrick, thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Mildred. Good morning, our viewers and listeners. I'm happy to join the panel. All right. And the last but not least on the panel is His Excellency Kamada, uh, Kameda Kazwaki, who is the ambassador 
uh, graduated from Hokiado University Faculty Law uh, in March 1978. Huge, uh, a huge CV as well, but he is the ambassador extraordinary uh, plenipotentiary of Japan to Uganda. Your Excellency, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, all of you. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to be present at this place, and uh, I'm happy to say something from my uh, more than 40 years diplomatic uh, life. All right, Ambassador, thank you so much. And of course, we'll kick off the discussion. And like I said earlier, this is particularly going to be focusing on financing for development. We are talking about sustainable development goals. They are 17. There are lots of issues that were raised on panel one, which included leadership, included um, lots of resourcing. But also Rita did pay attention to the aspect of hemorrhage, the monies that get lost. So simply to put it, corruption. But that's a discussion or, uh, for a later date. I want to start off with you, Dr. Patrick, uh, from the National Planning Authority. Of course, the government has prepared the third uh, national development plan. We want to believe and uh, agree that a number of people are getting to understand it, so as to be involved. But what are some of the financing requirements? Because we believe this plan cannot just be achieved from sitting in a room and discussing what has to be done, and then it will get achieved. Uh, thank you, Mildred. Now, before I talk about the requirements, the financing requirements, mm -hmm. uh, I need to associate with some of the views that came in the first panel yes. and also give uh, some background uh, on the challenges that we faced during uh, the financing of NDP2, and that has informed uh, the current financing. So, uh, in the previous panel, uh, Innocent... Uh, alluded to the fact that uh, uh, NDP2 missed the middle-income uh, target. Right now, uh, the NDP3, we are even pushing the gears a little bit higher. By now, trying to focus on household incomes as well as the quality of life. Mm. So uh, I must report that we've not gotten uh, the results that we, uh, we would have liked to get but we are at least moving in the right direction as government. So we have uh, achieved some results uh, on the social economic indicators, which are part of uh, the middle income uh, target going by the United Nations Development uh, Economic, Social Economic, uh, uh, the UNDESA uh, criteria. Having said that, I also want to associate myself with what Commissioner Joseph uh, talked about the programmatic approach that we are now focusing on uh, results. Mm. So we want to be financing uh, results such that we uh, stop looking at just uh, some mere small, small outputs, but the bigger result. So now, having said that, we've had a lot of financing challenges during the course of NDP2, so which we would like to fix within the NDP3 uh, implementation phase. We know that from the Public Finance Management Act, uh, the National Planning Authority uh, does conduct the Certificate of Compliance, we are, where we try to assess the compliance of the budget and uh, the national plan, because we would like to see the plans driving the budgets and not the other way around. So we have uh, always uh, found out that we, that the result of that assessment, rather the, the result of the alignment, is not, uh, uh, is not to the level that we'd like it to be. It is below, it is not satisfactory, it is below 70%. It has been below 70% across all the five years of the implementation of the other plan. And what does that mean? It means that much as uh, the annual budget is financing uh, parts of the plan, it is not financing the entire plan, or resources are going to areas that are not prioritized within the plan. So, that is uh, a very big problem, uh, but we are working with the ministry to try to fix that within the third government plan, as I'm going to uh, illustrate. We've also seen that uh, domestic resources have not grown to the level that we've uh, always wanted. Okay. The surest way of financing our development 
uh, plans is through uh, domestic resource mobilization. As a sovereign state, government would like to see that we are able to finance 100% of the budget, rather 100% of our plans. Uh, but uh, we are, we've witnessed a scenario in which we are not seeing uh, revenues growing to the level that are high enough to finance uh, the entire plan and that we have to work on it. Then we also have uh, challenges. We've had challenges in, the, uh, in, the, in our capital markets. Our capital markets have not helped us mobilize a lot of resources. There are so many innovative uh, financing instruments that can be used, but those, uh, but the capital markets have not given us uh, have not given us more resources to do finance uh, the plan. Then we are also seeing uh, a dwindling of the official development assistance. We've not had a lot of uh, development grants uh, to be able to finance uh, those plans. Talking about the coherency of uh, the various players, we've witnessed lots of uh, off-budget uh, off support in the various MDA activities. And that creates credibility for uh, the budget and the plan. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, would, we would like to see uh, we would like to see this off budget uh, being reported or being captured within uh, the budget. Now, turning to the question of um, what are the financing requirements, mm. we have done actually uh, we have uh, uh, we, we have a very conservative estimate that we need to have 412 trillion uh, in the next five years to finance the National Development Plan Three. That is uh, the component that the government of Uganda can give. Of that, the component of government of Uganda can, can raise now is 276, 276 trillion, which is equivalent to 67.3%, meaning that we have to uh, raise 27.5% of our GDP annually to be able to finance uh, our development plan. Mm. The, the, now, the private sector component uh, that that, that, that can finance part of that uh, plan is equal to 32.7%, which is equal to uh, 134.8, or you can say 135 trillion, is expected to come from the private sector, and that is at a very conservative estimate, uh, netting off uh, recurrent expenses. So where are we going to raise these resources from? As I, as I alluded to in the first place, that we have to uh, implement our domestic resource mobilization strategy, which calls upon uh, government to grow the revenue base. Okay. How should we grow the revenue base? This time around, we want to enrich the households. So production should take place from the parish level such that we are able to have a huge tax base. We are able to see individuals, households engaged in production uh, such that everybody can contribute a fair share uh, to uh, the national resources. We also would like to see uh, the growth in the tax revenue, and we are targeting to, to grow this by 0.5% annually on average during uh, the next five years. So we expect to improve uh, tax administration. Some of these, uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, shortages do not require uh, resources. So just need to empower the tax man, URA, to make sure that the taxpayers are able to comply uh, with, uh, uh, with the payment. We also need to address some uh, tax policy uh, design and deficiencies, such that we have a number of tax hurdles, such as uh, VAT being more productive, so that we are able to raise the resources, because the potential is high, and we have lots of exemptions that we need to do away with. Okay. The other thing uh, is we have to look at uh, uh, external financing. It's going to be another source. So in this external financing, we have targeted, to, we have targeted around 1.6% uh, of concessional loans to come from multilateral uh, creditors. And we would like to minimize domestic financing at less than 1% of uh, GDP. One of the challenges that I have not talked about is that we are seeing... Uh, uh, we are seeing the shrinking of a fiscal space, 
uh, because of uh, some high interest payments, mm. uh, increase in debt, although I, I must report that debt is still uh, within sustainable levels, but that doesn't mean that we should still contract more and more debt. Then we would also like to leverage other innovative financing uh, uh, ways. We have the South to South Corporation. Uh, we've gotten lots of resources uh, from uh, that arrangement. Okay. Then the remittances from uh, Ugandan is from uh, abroad. We just need to have uh, proper financing infrastructure within which we can uh, utilize uh, those resources so that they can be channeled to uh, uh, productive ways. Then we also <clears throat> would like to address the weaknesses in the public investment management cycle to to minimize on the losses that we, we have uh, seen. Uh, Mildred and viewers, uh, uh, just to report, we have uh, the, manage, the public investment management cycle, we have seen weaknesses at various stages, at the conceptualization stage, pre-feasibility stage, uh, the feasibility stage, the financing stage, the implementation uh, phase. There are lots of delays and uh, duplication of efforts across other MDAs. So the introduction of uh, uh, the integrated uh, database on the bankable projects is going to help us do that. Then the, to tie all this together, there is an opportunity that uh, the UN agencies uh, are giving us the development of the integrated financing framework. This is going to uh, help us in identifying all the relevant sources that we can use to finance, uh, to finance the various aspects of the development plan, okay. which development plan has uh, the, is, is finance, which development plan is also implementing the sustainable development goals and our other regional commitments like the Ag Africa Agenda 2063. Thank you. Okay, maybe just before you leave, you talked about the plan for government to grow tax revenue by at least 0.5% annually. Government growing uh, domestic tax revenue by 0.5% at least annually. And this you've said you want to deal with by focusing on household incomes. Are you putting this growth rate in context of the COVID-19 situation and the adverse effects of COVID-19 on the economy, or are these you know, plans and percentages that were perceived and conceptualized before the COVID-19 situation? I must report that um, we have incorporated the COVID-19 situation within the plan, and uh, I must report that the earlier growth that we had projected has actually gone down, okay? So when this growth went down, even other uh, economic uh, uh, economic indicators have also uh, been looked into. But targeting the households, yeah, what, uh, uh, the households are integral in this development plan because that is where our focus is in the sense that uh, you've heard of the parish model in which we want to make uh, our parishes or production, organization of uh, uh, business, or organization of economic activities, farming, be it farming or other entrepreneurial activities at that particular level, such that households are able <clears throat> to increase on their incomes. Mm. So you cannot tax somebody who is not earning anything. In order to tax individuals, individuals must first grow their incomes, their disposable incomes, such that uh, we are able to get something from them. So all the organization, you, we are, very soon we are going to see lots of... Uh, projects and activities at the parish uh, in which we are going to have players that will try uh, to mobilize uh, the, uh, the players at the parish level such that we can get everybody moving into this. Besides the COVID-19 response uh, that, we, uh, uh, that we have proposed with the Ministry of uh, Finance uh, is targeting small enterprises at that level. So it is in line, it, uh, it takes cognizance of the COVID-19 uh, effects as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Patrick. We'll be coming back to you. And to come to you, Your Excellency, um, Kameda, 
we, we, we clearly know, and this is out of evidence scientifically, that has shown that um, development assistance has actually been declining. And uh, this may even become worse after uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which we're still in. And, and it's also been highlighted by Dr. Patrick that it continues to go down each and every passing day. Uh, as, as, as one of the major development partners, what do you think um, is the vision for development uh, financing in Uganda? Because there are all these goals, very great for development of nations, but financing remains a key resource that needs to be paid attention to. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, it really, now difficult uh, moment uh, for the even developed partners uh, to extend uh, uh, financing to the development assistance. Mm -hmm. But uh, first of all, mm, uh, I uh, congratulate the UN country team uh, on the launch of this UN uh, Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework. Yeah. Uh, you know, that is a great achievement for the coherence of uh, among UN agencies, so that uh, this is a great step forward. Secondly, uh, Uganda is already well known as a country, uh, a country uh, to align uh, its national development plan, uh, Vision 2040, uh, very closely with uh, uh, with. Uh, 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 SDGs, yeah. so, so that uh, this uh, 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 cooperation framework is a very good position uh, to support uh, the government of Uganda's implementation of the uh, National Development Plan 3. Yeah. So uh, it is very, I think, promising. Uh, before talking about uh, financing, uh, I have to uh, emphasize that uh, uh, the basic philosophy of the uh, TICAT process uh, that was initiated by Japan in 1993, uh, TICAT stands for Tokyo International Conference on African Development. Uh, the, Philosophy is that uh, Africa's ownership and the international, com international community's partnership on African development. So, an African country is on the driving seat to take the steering wheel uh, to drive the, towards the development of uh, its country. And uh, we develop partners, including UN agencies and other partners, is in a, to support uh, that country from the passenger seat. Uh, so developed partners has to respect the uh, ownership of its country for the development. Uh, and this uh, comes to the also financing. Uh, I'm happy that uh, uh, previous speaker, uh, Dr. Orowo, started with his uh, uh, remarks for the uh, domestic financing. Yeah. I think this is logical that in order to uh, uh, demonstrate the ownership of the program, also they have to demo demonstrate the uh, responsibility of the financing. No. So here there should be a self-help effort to be shown. Although uh, it is uh, very difficult to find uh, necessary financial resources entirely domestically uh, to meet the needs. So then uh, 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 development partners uh, are willing to, to uh, give us some support. Mm -hmm. But once again, that uh, we have to, to see that the local government, uh, uh, the government of uh, Uganda in this case, to show maximum effort to raise their finances. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, one is that, uh, yes, under the, under the now COVID-19 pandemic, uh, every country, including Japan and other developed countries, are hit by uh, severely. Uh, nevertheless, still, I think uh, you are witness that uh, developers are supporting uh, 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 the developing countries' effort to cope with this, so that uh, there are some uh, space, but uh, it is not uh, uh, expected so easily to, um, to mobilize uh, uh, funds as before. So, I, I want to say that uh, even UN is willing to support, but they have to mobilize their resources from outside mm -hmm. to implement. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, from the, <coughs> the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also we have to fight to negotiate with the Ministry of Finance. Uh -huh to uh, get the finance for the, for, uh, the development assistance to the developing countries so that uh, to, uh, to negotiate with the financial authority in the government and uh, UN agencies probably difficult to, to convince development partners to, to squeeze some funds to them. No? Okay. Yeah, sadly, just to let me know. Uh, hmm. Now, mainly you consider development partners, uh, OECD DAC countries, like uh, uh, European, US, Japan, and those countries. But uh, I think uh, now there are uh, BRICS countries like China, India, and <laughs> Arab countries that are com coming as uh, emerging uh, uh, development partners. So, so that uh, uh, you, you have to, to, to think about maybe mobilization for other partners, like those countries, also uh, foundations, private foundations, and private sectors. I think uh, uh, UN agencies are doing already, but uh, I think uh, more efforts are needed. As uh, 30 years ago, uh, the total GDP of G7 countries occupied around 50% of the world GDP, while BRICS at that time 70% or something. But nowadays, uh, G7 countries occupy only 30%, one third of the world GDP, while uh, uh, BRICS countries surpassed that uh, 37 or something. I, I cannot remember exactly, but uh, that is bigger. But uh, the budget uh, contributors uh, for the U uh, UNHCR 2018 of the innovative funding. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that is very reassuring from um, His Excellency Kazuaki when he says that uh, the development partners are actually still very committed to support um, development in Uganda and fund. But two aspects, of course, that are very key. I totally agree with him value for money for the countries for the development partners that are sending in this money and of course this is achieved through accountability that we expect funding for the sustainable development